Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I think I've said good morning to almost every one of you. Uh, good morning, Almarie. Goeiemorgen, Celeste. Wonderful. Hi, Melinda. Hello, everyone. We're about to start the session. Good morning, Vilma. Good morning. I hope you have a cup of coffee with you. Good morning, Carl van den Berg. Good morning, Ina. Good morning, Bram. We have another great session lined up uh, today. I have my coffee. I hope you have yours. I have a notebook. Mm. I have my cell phone ready because at some point we're going to ask you to take out your cell phone so that we can play a menti game. Hello, Lizette. Hello, Peter Phyllis. Um, good morning, good morning, good morning, studio. Good morning to you. We saw your camera on this morning. That was kind of cute. Okay, I think let's give it one more minute. Maybe in the meantime, can you tell me where in the world you are joining us from? Are you in Klerksdorp? Are you in Bloemfontein? Are you in Kakamas, Colesburg, Kuruman, Sutherland? Where are you this morning? Tell me where you're from. I am sitting in Bramfontein. I can see the Witz uh, University from where I'm sitting in this little private property makeshift studio. Hello, Almal, Bloemfontein, Bethlehem. I see you. I see you, Evelyn Kruger from Javits Properties, Bloemfontein. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this very special nexus. Zuanin, you are in Kempton Park. Fantastic. And then we also have Hartebeus Poort, Rastenburg Northwest, Melinda from Freiburg. Hi, Toiki Gold here, Bloemfontein. Uh, and then we also have Johan here from Expello in, Johannes in Johannesburg. Did you hear me say Johannesburg? My goodness. Celeste is joining us from Umslanga. So today we are looking forward to another wonderful day. We started our Nexus series yesterday. And um, let me quickly greet, because we must greet, we must say hello first. Thank you for joining us for our first Nexus series of the year. I'm Tracy Lee Miller, and I'm the brand and marketing executive here at Private Property. I'm going to be your host for this morning's session. So maybe you know, but maybe you, you don't. But the word Nexus actually means a series of connections linking two or more things. And that's exactly what this Nexus event is about. It's a series of digital networking events that cultivates people connection and we share knowledge and we network. Our first event was hosted in November last year and it was really, really very successful and well received by the industry. So we decided let's bring it back as private and make it a little bit bigger and better than before. One way that we've done this is by tailoring the events to specific regions so that the insights that we talk about and talk through and share are really relevant to you and your area. And it gives you the best possible chance of achieving success in a very tough market. Um, we have an excellent lineup for you today but before we get started allow me to just point out a couple of things on this platform hi palessa hi jean welcome 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 to everyone if you look at the platform on your right hand side on the right hand side of the screen you'll see chat where everyone is greeting and interacting with each other if if you don't mind or if you can do me a big favor what won't you find like a smiley face or send an emoji here that represents kind of like how you feel at the moment. This is my emoji. It's a green heart because we recently, about a year ago tomorrow, in fact, we rebranded. Drop either a green heart or a smiley face or something so I can get you using those emojis like young people use emojis. Right next door, you... you you click if you click participants then you can see all the delegates that are here and if you hang your cursor next to their names you can send them a message directly or you'll be able to do you can look at their profile or you can send them a message directly like i said the last button here at the end is really very cool 
So this button helps us to ask questions, whether we want to add our names to it or whether we want to ask the question anonymously. So I'm going to ask a question. The question is, what is your fave song? I actually wanted to play some real dance music, but unfortunately I couldn't make it work on the system. But I know that, for instance, in the Northern Cape, there's that beautiful music that you have and then dance you mean so let it stuff Swiss done. And if Freistad and in Northwest, maybe tell me in the chat what your favorite song is. And uh, another feature of this QA button here is if you like the question, you can upvote the question by clicking that little triangle at the top of the question. You can see I even upvoted my own. Uh, question and more of my colleagues and friends are you guys also upvoting the question you can then use the chat to answer that question so what's your favorite song my favorite song is um happy birthday to you so this platform is incredibly interactive and it's just it's even more interactive when we get to interact with you for this session, I want to do something very special because we're not that many in the room. I'm going to ask that one of the questions that we pose here in the Q&A, um, we're going to bring someone up to answer that question. So someone that is a guest, maybe think of it like in the olden days, if you attended an event, then someone would pass you the mic and you'd have to stand up. So for this one, when we bring you onto the stage, and I know I'm jumping this on studio now, sorry studio, but when we, dis when we bring the person on stage, they have to switch on their camera, they have to switch on their mic, and they have to just uh, greet us, say a few words, maybe share some of their thoughts with us. And that is something that we haven't done before. It's going to be something brand new to try out together. Other than interacting and engaging on the platform, I'd like you to know one or two more things. The first one is when people ask a good question, we're going to give you a prize. The best question gets a prize. And the person who engages the most, we will also call you out and give you a prize just to keep that, you know, that interest going. And then finally, we have um, courtesy of AISA, uh, managed to get uh, this ses session registered for one and a half non-fair verifiable CBT points. Um, all you have to do is stick around till the end of the session and then click the link, uh, the link that will take you to the place where you register for the non-verifiable CPD points. That was a mouthful. So let me just hear from you guys in the room. Are you with me? Can, do I have to repeat anything? Can I quickly just, let's get the first speaker ready in the meantime, studio. Tell me where, there we go. Yay for the CPD points. Yes, honey, we want those points. Good morning, Paul. How are you? Good morning, Tando. Hello, everybody. Gre greetings, greetings, greetings. Thank you so much for joining us today. So let's get started. Please can we welcome onto the stage the APSA Regional Manager for Home Loans Central, which includes Free State, Northwest, and Northern Cape. His name is Tando Majola. Hi, Tando, how are you doing? Good morning, Tracy, and thank you so much, Tracy, for having me this morning. And also, good morning to all the participants from the beautiful city of Business uh, in Bloemfontein. Are you in Bloemfontein? Okay, yes, I'm wonderful. In Welcome. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Welcome, Tando. I'm going to switch off my camera and my microphone. Um, delegates and friends, please comment in the box, ask questions, um, interact, drop a drop an emoji if you, if if, he, if Tando says something that kind of makes you go go wow. Um, so let's let's keep that energy going. Just because we can't see each other physically, it doesn't mean that we won't be able to feel each other's presence in this room today. So I'm switching off. Good luck to you, Tando. Thanks, Tracy. Once again, good morning to all the participants. 
from the beautiful city of Roses, Bloemfontein. My name is Tando Majola, and I look after the homeless business in Central for Free State. I'm also standing in for my colleague Narasa David, who is looking after Northwest. A warm welcome to, to everyone this morning. I'm very honored uh, to be part of the session with our industry experts, and a huge thank you to our strategic partners, Private Property, for having such an awesome event. We're going to start. Uh, we're going to go to our first slide for presentation. Let's start. 2020. Wow, what a year. And what a journey it has been for all of us. It feels just like yesterday when we celebrated the box, winning the World Cup, and no one knew what's ahead in 2020. Once again, proving that no one is a crystal ball seeing the future. COVID-19 has been a huge impact, not only for our industry, our provinces, our country, but to the, to the world at large. If we look back to exactly a year ago, we were getting ready to go into lockdown level five, which had a huge impact and a complete shutdown for the property industry. And one for many of us, that meant that we were unable to do what we love and do best for almost two months. I'm quite sure a lot of us had to rethink what was important for us. And I'm also sure over the past year, we all have someone or know of someone who has lost a loved one. For many in our country, it has impacted the way we live, earn a living, and conduct our business. Can we go over to slide three, please? So, what did this mean for the property industry? I would like to call this, a, this slide a tale of two halves. Two very opposing halves. The lockdown essentially put us in a position where we took two months out of the economic activity and this then resulted in a very devastating impact on the industry. We experienced a decline in property sales for us as a bank, we saw this being reflected in the decline of application volumes. This was during the first half of 2020. We were, we were experienced a 9% decline compared to 20, 2019. However, the second half of the year of 2020 showed us a different picture quite the opposite of the first half. It was indeed very remarkable for us to witness the property sales bouncing back in the second half of the year, which I believe all of us were very happy for. During this period as a bank, we saw an application volumes growing by 36%. So from a negative 9% in H1 to a positive 36% in H2, really two very opposing views. In addition, from a business office perspective, we saw the growth in activity translate into the greater registrations with the second half of the year. The registrations in A2 equate to more than double the number of registrations in the first half of the year. Another interesting point to share as well, we kept on seeing quality of customers coming through the door last year. We were, we were seeing the quality of the customer holding out as we entered H2, and this enabled us to keep our approval rates in line with those of pre-lockdown levels, a remarkable recovery. Tale of two halves, a dramatic turn of downturn in the first half of the year, and then even more dramatic increase in the second half of the year. And we move to slide four. What are the customers saying about ownership? 
So watching all the activity in the market, it was indeed very exciting, but exactly did this, what did this tell us about what our customers were thinking? Obviously, as we all know, our customers during such a difficult time have different views. The own ownership sentiment index is also affectionately known as the EPSA HSI, watching the, the movement and sentiment across different customer types and provinces as well. The EPSA HSI is a proprietary index which tests customers' confidence in the market. It was very pleasing for us to see that at the end of last year, the customer confidence was at its highest, not just for 2020 period, but since the actual inception of the index in 2015. And we can then definitely agree it was remarkable to see those results. There are four main contributors to the confidence increase of 4% in quarter four of 2020, which resulted in the overall confidence ending the year at 80%. Firstly, we look at the demand side. There were few factors to consider, one being the ability, the ability of property to increase in value over time. Secondly, our current low interest rate cycle made the debt financing more affordable. And when we look at the supply side, we have seen support that has originated from resilient house prices. The second factor was the renewed motivation by owners to invest in their existing properties. What we've seen from a regional perspective, looking at uh, central and looking at specifically free state, towards the sentiment results with 75%, Northern Cape with a 60%, which were below national sentiment and of 80%, and Northwest were at 90%, which was above the national sentiment, definitely promising there for the Northwest. Can we move on to slide six, please? Now we look at the overall sentiment from a regional perspective and looking at this picture, I just want to, we're sharing the, looking at the big uh, metros across the country, looking at KZN, Gauteng and Western Cape. And it is most pleasing to see the overall, all of these regions have shown an increase in the overall sentiment. We must acknowledge the notable increase by the Western Cape. In comparison to the prior years, a huge factors to consider would be the semigration. This drive the sentiment could attribute to customers having the need to work from anywhere they want to be virtually. At the heart of these decisions are lifestyle and the ease of comfort of working from home, which meant that um, people wanted to move to areas which where they, they were comfortable with. Gauteng, however, remains the region with the highest sentiment at 81%. And this was evident by the largest increase in applications coming by Gauteng last year. As mentioned, Free State with a 75%, Northern Cape with a 60%, below the national sentiment of 80%, and Northwest at 90% above the national sentiment of 80%. Just a few points. There was a 78% sentiment of buying over renting. Ultimately, the question of why rent, if you can afford to buy, is a huge factor to consider. The sentiment was 79% towards investing and 86%, uh, which was in the free state, and 86% was in Northwest. Moving on to our slide seven, we looked at four customer types. The first type is the first time homeowner, the homeowner, not first time buyer, the rent, the renter and the investor. When looking at the homeowner sentiment by these four types, you can see that the customer types have seen an improvement in sentiment by the end of the year, thus boosting the overall confidence. The two customer types that really stood out as a very, very interesting were the existing owners, the orange line in the projected screen, and the investors in the dark purple. 
existing owners always lacked the industry uh, more than uh, most of the time, most likely due to the low, lower than expected financial benefit benefit of going process of buying and selling a property. However, they are the customers who have seen the greatest growth in sentiment from the end of 2019 to the end of 2020 with a 10% increase. Very noteworthy to mention is where the sentiment was in quarter one of 2020 to the change in quarter four of 2020. Once again, this could be driven by the new ways of work, the lifestyle impact, lockdown where customers are looking for homes with a study, a bigger garden for the kids, or there isn't the urgent need to be close to work as normal with most South Africans working from home. The low interest rates are also, provide, also provided them the affordability to purchase new property. Looking at the investor, the investor had the highest drop in sentiment in the heart of the lockdown, and investors chose not to aid to their proper portfolios and adopted a wait and see approach. As we all know, cash is king. This was influenced by the economic activity as well as a sharp increase in rental defaults. Obviously, as we know, customers started to feel the pressures of the lockdown and the pandemic as customers' finances were impacted by the lockdown. They, however, bounced back and returned to the top of the highest sentiment, likely above the first time home buyers who drove most of the surge in activity last year. If there is one thing this slide teaches us, is that 2020 was the year to get into property. From a central pr uh, perspective, we saw, we saw a definite increase in the first time home buyers. And also we've been noted, noting that uh, existing property owners Invest, investing quite substantially in their existing uh, properties to make it comfortable for them to work from home. When we move to slide eight, looking at the buying versus the selling sentiment in the market, the sentiments towards is the top line in red, returned to 2019 and ended 8% higher with a year-on-year -year comparison. This is the main driver be behind the increase in the interest in properties. I'm also sure you are experiencing this in the market and experienced this last year as well. We must, however, note the bottom line where the sentiments towards selling has still not recovered to the 2019 levels. This has decreased by 7% year on year. Whilst we note the gradual improvement, we are still at the pre-lockdown levels. This means that the gap between wanting to sell and wanting to buy continues to be widened, meaning that there are even more willing buyers than there are willing sellers in the market now. Uncertain times, wanting to hold on to their properties rather started a new 20 to 30 years cycle. So we believe that um, obviously that's why we don't have such a lot of sellers in the market that they want to hold on due to uncertain times. We have seen this impacting the continuation of property prices in the market, especially in the price segments of 730 and 50,000 to 1.5 million, where most of the activity occurred. It is also placing pressure on stock this, in this price segment, which may result in the property prices starting to increase. Purchase prices in general has been higher as buyers has been reaching to buy more expensive properties, given the improvements in affordability resulting from the reduction in interest rates and we anticipate that activity will start to increase in the next price band. From a central perspective, we have felt the pressure of more stock in the market, and we felt that pressure with availability of stock, in, especially more in Bloemfontein 
looking at uh, how we see multiple listings and also multiple submissions on one property. When we move to my slide nine, so what does the future hold? Well, what is the crystal ball of property saying for our industry? Firstly, for sure, we're not yet out of the woods when it comes to the pandemic. And there's various views on a third and a fourth wave concerns in the country. Looking at interest rates, we have established by now that the low interest rate cycle has been the driver of a positive sentiment and the coincidental increase in home prices. So let's make it count whilst it lasts. We believe that almost interest rates have essentially reached the bottom of the cycle. We will remain at the current levels until quarter four, 2021, where they will start gradually rising again. The rise we believe will be so gradual that the, inter that the interest rates will not have a recovery to pre-lockdown levels by the end of 2023. As we move on to our slide 11, house prices. The recent developments supporting an increase in the number of willing buyers has placed an upward pressure on prices, although it remains to be seen by how much they will support an increase. Purchase prices has a general been higher as buyers have been reaching to buy more expensive properties, given the improvements in affordability and resulting from the reduction in the interest rates. As we move on to slide 12, looking at the market growth by our provinces and the predictions going forward, with the red bars at the bottom of reflecting market growth in 2020, we can see that across the board, regions performed lower than in, in, than in 2019, demonstrating that, this, that despite the amazing recovery in H2, in most instances, they were not sufficient to recover year on year fully to 2019 levels. Once again, drawing you to the tail of two halves, looking at H1 last year and looking at H2 uh, year. The top row shows the predictions for 2021, which we calculated at the end of last year. We can see that the expectations are most um, positive across the regions for growth in 2021, with a particular, if I note uh, in central, at almost 6% at 5.9% growth expected for 2021. However, in many cases, we saw the coming of 2020. With our application in December up 47% versus 2019, um, 2020 versus 2019, we think that the market may grow even more than what we have predicted. After two full months of performance in 2021, our application volumes continue to be resilient, up 21%. Uh, if we compare February 2020 versus February uh, 2021, before the pandemic, there is still a level of uncertainty in forecasting models for the, the year ahead. We will still also know that deeds officers closures arising from some regions and the uncertainty of a third wave, all crystal balls are a little murky now. We've been experiencing these closures in Bloemfontein's deeds office over the last few weeks, and I believe it might not be the end of it as we are in challenging times. The one thing that holds true, however, and somewhat having been throughout the heart of the pandemic last year is the South Africans aspirations of owning your own home remains a core aspiration and it is where your roots are placed. And I think we can definitely, uh, as industry players, be, be, be very uh, proud and, and, and happy for the role we are playing in assisting these South Africans and aspiring to own a home and making their dreams come true. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you continue to make dreams of South Africans come true. 
So thank you to you all for assisting us in partnering with us on the journey we aspire to house the nation and shape the industry in a meaningful way. We are APSA Homelands. I thank you so much allowing me for the platform and wish you all of the best for 2021. Thank Once you, again, Tando. Thank you, you so, so much. Please stay on the stage with me. Um, we, I see there's a couple of questions that came through on the chat, not on the Q&A tab, but because it's not too many, I think we can handle it here. Tando, thank you for the insights. Uh, it's incredible. Um, there's a question here from Johan Janse van Rensburg. He's asking, are there home loan bond applications for recent graduates from university who started working even though they have no credit profile? That's one of the questions. And then there's a long question. I think maybe do you want to do you want to touch on that one, um, Tando? Yes, thank you, Tracy. Uh, Tracy, we have uh, uh, a product which we offer to, to uh, young professionals, which is uh, one of the best offerings in the market, um, looking at uh, graduates earning up to 35,000, um, looking at their age younger than 35 years. Um, so definitely looking at the qualifications up to NKF 8. So definitely we have solutions for those young graduates who are entering their first properties into the market. And obviously we're also looking at offering loan to value of up to 105%. So definitely Joanne, there is a product which awesome. we can look Maybe at, if uh, someone, solutioning your Thank customers. you so much, Tando. Maybe we can get someone to Thanks, reach Tracy. out to you, Han, and, uh, and maybe just expose him to that product. Um, Mike Spencer, who was a table guest of mine in the session before we actually started, Mike is asking, or saying, in the free state region, there has been little development for the past 10 years. With high purchase numbers in the less expensive property market, do you think that there will be a, a shortage of rental property properties when the economy upturns? Um, and then he goes on to say, we are finding that many student accommodation units are being led to non-student tenants which indicates that there could be a shortage in that market. But with many investors selling to owner occupiers, the number of units to rent is being restricted. When the market changes, there is likely to be a, a severe shortage in the rental market and a strong upward surge in rentals. You know what, Mike, we are actually, our next speaker is your head Smuts and Jan Dowell from Payprop, and they're going to share some really interesting insights around the rental market. Tando, if you want to just tackle the first part of that question or, 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 or respond to Mike, I'll, I'll mute my. Thanks, Tracy. Yes, um, we, as, as, as mentioned earlier, we've, we've seen that. Uh, um, Obviously, stock in, in, in especially in the Bloemfontein, where we had quite a large number of rentals for especially for students coming under pressure. But we're also quite aware that there's quite a number of a few developments uh, lined up, obviously going to to the processes for approvals, which might um, create a bit of stock in the market, uh, and we can then see the movement in the market. So definitely, um, it is actually a point of concern uh, looking at the stock levels but I'm, I'm quite sure that um, with developments coming up and developers looking for opportunities we can definitely and I think Mike also dropped a question in the Q&A section there saying there is a shortage of low-end stock but few sites zoned and serviced what is APSA doing about the provision of new bulk building sites I think um, your earlier question Mike also asking about um, a product, I think. Let me let me quickly look at it. I think you responded to Mike, and perhaps um, Mike, if you um, if Tando, if you just want to respond to this question of what is APSA doing about the provision of new bulk building sites, um, my suggestion is that 
you guys take this offline, you know, and immediately connect after the session so that, you know, you you, you can discuss this, this because um, it sounds like a very specific uh, um, question that Mike is asking. Thanks, thanks, Tracy. I will I will keep in touch with Mike, and also we're working very closely with our commercial property finance team, who is looking after the co uh, the, the commercial property financing financing of obviously in terms of park in, in infrastructure investment. But okay, Tando, I think we're going to leave with, it there for Thank now. You. Um, you are you can get into the limo and uh, leave the stage. Thank you so much, guys. Let's say thank you to Tando for taking us through through that presentation. Um, I'm sure there were some interesting insights there, specifically in your market, in your area. And again, I just wanna say thank you to, to APSA, our partners, in bringing this nexus through to you and creating this platform for engagement. I, I can already start seeing the, 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 the tables turning. All right, let's move on to a little bit of fun. I'm going to ask you to take out your cellular phones and go to a website called www.menti.com. www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And then if you will be so kind as to enter a code, and this is the code. Thank you, Studio. Studio just dropped that code into the chat. The code is 45628137, 45628137. Yes, Paul, uh, Kruger, de Klerk van Logrenberg, we are going to make these presentations available again afterwards because, of course, um, yeah, a person can be a little bit distracted when you're attending such events. But um, also, if you can give us a week or two, we just want to complete this, this sort of the nexus which will end this week on Thursday. And then we'll put the content together and send it out to you so that you can again go through it at your own leisure and then um, make contact with the relevant uh, people. I think I have a couple of people on the Menti platform. Uh, so Leslie, Celeste, your head, Volma, Jean, Marianne, Mpo, Please put in your real name and not a strange pseudonym because it will come up on the screen here and it'll be very embarrassing if we have to <laughs> if we have to call you out. I hope you have a nice cup of coffee ready there. Johan Janse, you're in. Peter, you're in. Hanley, you're in. Carl, you're in. Palesa, I see you. I think let's get started, studio. You can catch us. If you're not in yet, you can catch us along the way. We're going to do this a second time. What is your job title or your role within the company? Um, are you a principal agent, state agent, other, CEO, executive, franchise owner, owner? Okay, fantastic. We can see then the majority of the people in the room are... Um, Principal agents, managing brokers, and estate agents and intern agents. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for letting us know. One CEO in the room. Hello. What type of real estate transactions do you specialize in? Sales and rentals? Sales only or rentals only? Boom. Look at those responses coming in so quickly. Sometimes you answer so quickly and it's the wrong answer and you can't go back. Uh, I've experienced that before in the past. So, okay, sales and rentals, both, and then sales. Okay, fantastic. Let's go to the next question. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Do you multitask when attending virtual meetings? Can you guess who asked that question? That was obviously me. Zero, zero, sorry. The first option is, yes, I'm guilty. Let's see how many people are very honest in the room. Yes, I'm guilty would have been my response as well. The second option is my mind tends to wander as it as it does. The the third option is no, I'm 100% focused. I think that's Ben and Trish, and then <laughs> and then sometimes. But yeah, the majority of you saying, ah, you know what, my, my I'm a little bit guilty sometimes. 
multitask when att attending these virtual events and meetings. Let's go to the next question. We're almost at the end. In your opinion, is this a buyer or seller's market? In your opinion, is this a buyer or seller's market? You had to think about that one for a little bit. Yes, a lot of people saying initially buyers uh, and a few saying seller's market. Is there someone in the audience that wants to come up and tell us why they say buyer's market? Or let me start, let me say, why do you say seller's market when so many are saying buyer's market? If you are willing to come up and give us your thought on why you think it's a seller's market, please just drop your name into the chat and Ben and Studio will get in touch with you. Do we have one more question, please, Studio? Yeah, a lot more people saying that it's a buyer's market versus a seller's market. Perhaps the person, one of the four, that says it's a seller's market, are you keen to tell us why? And then here we go in one word, and I'm going to ask you to please keep it, keep it, uh, keep it clean. Give me one word how you would describe 2021 so far. So exciting comes up, promising, interesting, cautious, I crap, awesome, chaotic, opportunities coming through, eventful coming through. Can I remind everyone that we're only in March? I feel like it's already June, July. So yeah, fresh, exciting, eventful, active, chaotic, um, and, and a little bit crap as well for some. All right, thank you, productive. I like product. So obviously more, more people saying exciting and promising, which is why the, in the word cloud that comes up um, bigger. If you could change one thing in the South African real estate industry right now, what would it be? This is the last question in this series. <clears throat> and then we're going to take a short five, seven minute break before we bring up the um, CEO of PayProp. Uh, he'll be followed by the PayProp head of data and analytics, your head smarts. And uh, they're going to take us through the 2020 rental market in review and what the future holds. So let's have a look at what you said, the, what your responses were to this final question in the Menti, first Menti series. If you could change one thing in the South African real estate industry right now, what would it be? Faster registration period. You'll change the regulator. You'll try to unlock more stock. The EAAB, EAAB management. Education of buyers and sellers, something as private property we're also incredibly keen on. Getting rid of time wasters, okay, we, we hear you. For rental agencies and homeowners to have more options to protect their properties or portfolios. For example, an eviction management service, which Expello offers in the industry. Uh, another thing you would change is teach estate agents and agencies to work together and not against one another. Yeah, that collaboration became and partnership became such an important thing during during lockdown, especially. And then we've got EAAB processes as well, that one of the things that you would change if you could um, with of, uh, 12 responses in total. Okay, let's move on. Thank you. So the price of NQF4 and logbook training as well as the EAAB. Um, thank you so much for, for your thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at the chat here to see if there's anything that I've missed. Uh, Hilary Evans, you're saying trouble with clearance certificates. So do I have someone willing to tell me why they think it's a seller's market? versus buyer's market. Um, ben, can you keep an eye on the on the chat for me? And then let's see if we can bring, bring you on after the break. We're taking a break now. Let's be back here in about five minutes when we will bring on your head smuts and Jan Davel from PayProp, who will share some really interesting insights with us around the rental market. Thank you so much again for joining us for this Nexus in partnership with APSA and with the participation of PayProp and partnership of PayProp as well. Thank you so much and we'll be
Great. Thank you, Celeste. Okay. So back to our national rental growth and inflation graph. Um, as you can see, inflation is there in blue and rental growth is in red. So over the past two years, and especially over the last year, you can see that rental growth really, really took a knock. And this is mostly due to lockdown. Um, yeah, in 2019, rental growth, sorry, trended. In 2019, rental growth trended between uh, 3 and 4% for most of the time. And then here in March came lockdown. Rental growth was under severe pressure. And in November, we even saw negative rental growth. So what that means is this is a year-on-year -year number. So from November 2019 to November 2020, the average rent that we saw in Paycrop actually got cheaper by 10 rand. But still, it was first. So why is rental growth under such immense, immense pressure at the moment? Um, and I think the affordability reason goes without saying. We know of many people who lost their jobs or lost their income, whether it was fully or partially um, when lockdown was announced. And that obviously put severe uh, pressure on someone's finances. Um, so that played a role. And also, because of finances, many people might not be looking to move to a larger and a more expensive property. So on the demand side, there's um, downward pressure on rental prices. And then also on the supply side, there's a bit of an oversupply of property, and that's for two reasons. Um, we saw many Airbnb properties being moved from the short-term rental market to the long-term rent rental market because they were standing empty uh, when no one could travel. And then secondly, due to the low interest rates, many investors were buying, probably are still buying, uh, buy-to-let properties, and that again floods the market with rental properties. That oversupply also puts down the pressure on the rental growth, and we don't see these two factors uh, changing anytime soon. So we expect the rental market to remain under pressure for at least this year. Now, if we look at the same data and we look at it quarterly, so again, we're measuring year on year, we can see at the end of last year, rental growth from 2019's last quarter to 2020's last quarter was only 0.2%. If you look at the trend line in blue, you can see that, um, as I mentioned earlier, rental growth was trending between 3 and 4% for most of 2019. Um, that went into 2020. And then, of course, at the end of Q1, uh, lockdown was announced. And then you can see the effect that had on the rental growth. So now let's compare the three provinces to the national rental growth. Starting with the free state, you can see that the free state outperforms the national rental growth by far. Um, that was the case um, in 2019. Um, free states saw rental growth rates of 8.4% in the beginning of 2019. Again, at the end of 2019, that unfortunately due to lockdown also trended downward and ended the year at 1.6%. Looking at Northwest, not such a rosy picture. You can see here the last, even though it was, the province had great rental growth in 2019, the last two quarters of 2020 actually showed negative rental growth. Now, it's worth mentioning that in our system, Northwest is a bit of an anomaly. A few of our big clients um, do a lot of student housing and that affects stuff like um, the average price, um, the average age on, on the type of tenant that a credit check is done on because it's usually done on parents of students. So it all looks a bit uh, out of whack. Um, but yeah, two negative uh, growth quarters at the end of 2020 for the Northwest. Northern Cape is quite up and down. Um, also led to mining quite a lot. And you can see that it really recovered well from 2019 into 2020. And then, of course, lockdown had a negative effect on the rental growth, the province ending the year with negative 3% growth almost. So to put it into perspective, you can see here Free State has um, average rent of 6,500 6, rand. 
at the end of the year. Moving on to the Northwest, the cheapest province, 5,200 Rand. Um, but like I said, that's mostly due to um, student housing, which is a lot cheaper. And then the Northern Cape, one of the more expensive uh, provinces in the country. Five out of the nine provinces had negative rental growth at the end of 2020, which is actually quite unheard of, um, but we don't expect this to change anytime soon. Moving on to arrears. So when we look at arrears, we look at two different metrics. The percentage tenants in arrears, in other words, how many tenants have outstanding balances? And then we also look at the size of this arrears and that we express relative to rent. So if we look at the first one, the percentage tenants in arrears, you can see that pre-lockdown, we were at 19.4% nationally. In other words, one out of every five tenants had some level of arrears. That, of course, after the announcement of hard lockdown jumped up to one out of every four tenants. It's good to see that this metric has, has improved throughout the year, but it's still not at the pre-lockdown level. The same can be said for the average arrears percentage. So just to clarify what this 78% 78 means is that in the first quarter, a tenant who had rental arrears owed 78% of one month's rent. That, of course, uh, due to lockdown, jumped up a bit. Um, it peaked here in quarter three, where the other one peaked in quarter two. And also good to see that this recovered in the fourth quarter as well. Now, if we uh, compare the provinces once again, you'll see that the free state over last year mirrored this trend. Uh, peaked in quarter two at 28.9%, so almost one in three tenants in the free state um, were in arrears. And again, that um, recovered to 25%. That's, again, still lower than the at the beginning of the year before lockdown, where 23% of tenants were in arrears. Looking at the average size of arrears, again, uh, above the national average at the starting point, peaked in the fourth quarter and then ended slightly below the national average of 95%. Looking at Northwest, as one of, Northwest has one of the highest percentage of tenants in arrears along with the free state, started at 26% above the national average of 19, peaked in the second quarter and then it's slowly, sorry, slowly recovering um, and ended the year at 25%. Looking at the average area size again, started at a level above the national average of 91%, peaked at 107% of the month's rent, and then also recovered in the last quarter to 101%. Last province, the Northern Cape, exactly the same um, trend. Uh, it peaked in the second quarter, and then actually in the third quarter, it was below the national average and again recovered further to the third quarter. So it also ended the year uh, above the national average, but it is not too far from where it started before lockdown. Looking at the average areas percentage, started very much in line. It didn't increase too much. This is one of two provinces that actually peaked in the second quarter but the increase in the average area size was really almost negligible if you compare it to some of the other um, provinces and ended quite below the national average at 86% of one month's rent. So that's at least some good news for the Northern Cape. Why do we see these patterns? So as you can imagine, if uh, when lockdown hit, uh, many tenants were quite uncertain about their future cash flow. Were they able to go to work? When will they be able to go to work? How much savings do they have? So many of them stopped paying their rent in full. That's why it peaked in the second quarter. And then um, after the economy opened from the 1st of June, 
uh, tenants started paying their rent in full again and where they could even pay off their arrears because now there were more certainty around their cash flow. The reason why the average arrears only peaked in the third quarter is because this metric is a little more sticky. So tenants who had low levels of arrears and who were able to clear the debt or their debt did so and that pushed up the average. So like I said, the remaining arrears are quite sticky. Um, if you think about it, the only way for this average arrears size to actually decrease is for someone to firstly pay their rent in full and then on top of that, pay extra on that. And in the current economic climate, that is quite difficult to do for many tenants. Looking at credit metrics, I'm not going to go on about this for too long. Um, I just want to highlight one or two things. So we look at quite a few metrics um, when we do this. This data is from credit checks that's pulled through the pay crop system. So it doesn't necessarily track current tenants. It looks at the type of person or the, the credit profile of someone who is applying for a rental property. So just keep that in mind. So at the start of last year, um, one of the big ones is uh, major delinquency. So how many tenants have a major delinquency against their name? So that could be either you're in default or you have a notice against your name or you were three months or more in arrears within the last 12 months. Here's a bit of a list. And you can see started at 18% and then as we can expect, that went up a bit in the second quarter. And um, as with the arrears, uh, this um, improved towards the end of the year. The other one that I want to highlight is the debt to income ratio. We all know that the repo rate uh, was lowered quite substantially throughout the year last year, and you can see the effect of that on the debt to income ratio. It started the year at 47.9%, uh, which is actually quite a little bit higher than its, than its normal level, um, and then that declined down to 40% at the end of the year, which is really good to see. Of course, if people spend less of their net income on debt, they have more disposable income. So that also increased to just over 30% at the end of the year. And then quite surprisingly, looking at overall credit health, and that's something you can read in a credit score, you can see that this actually increased or improved during the year only by three points but it is still an improvement and it's not something uh, that I was expecting. So now if we compare the three provinces against national um, and I'm not again not going to go on um, about this for too long I just want to give you an indication of where the provinces measure against the national average. So if starting from the bottom credit score slightly lower debt, rent, affordability, disposable income, all in line, and then more uh, tenants have major delinquencies in the free state, income growth was negative, and there's also a lower net income in the free state than what we saw nationally. Moving on to the Northwest, and remember, so these credit checks are often done on a parent and not necessarily on the tenant who's a student in the paper world where we, where we do a lot of student housing through the system. Um, income at 33,000, not too bad, but again below the, the national average. Income growth was negative. Um, quite a substantial, uh, or, yeah, major delinquencies is substantially lower than the national average at 14%. Debt is in line. The rent to income ratio, because of the very low rents in the Northwest, you'll remember it's the cheapest province, um, people spent less of their income on rent, have more disposable income, and also have better credit, credit scores. This can also be attributed to the fact that it is mostly or usually older people um, on, on who these credit checks are performed and they often have better credit records. Lastly, moving on to the Northern Cape, at the end of the year, there was some good income growth. Um, income levels are below the national average. 
Almost one in three tenants in the Northern Cape has a major delinquency against their name. And that just highlights how important it is to vet tenants properly uh, if you are looking for good tenants. Debt ratio looks a bit better than national, more disposable income as a percentage, but unfortunately this um, credit score is 12 points lower than the national average. That is probably due to these, um, this high number of tenants with major delinquencies in the province. So why did credit metrics improve? And if I say credit metrics improve, I mean, why did the credit score overall not drop substantially? Um, because we know that most tenants have financial difficulty. And there are a few reasons. These are mostly ed educated guesses. But we know from, I mean, we all heard it in the news that lower income consumers in general uh, were hit harder when lockdown came. So for job losses, Etc. And it's possible that these lower income tenants who've lost their income moved out of the rental market in the short term. So moved in with family, and hence we are not seeing credit checks being done on them. Tenants could also be staying longer in their property again uh, because of affordability, and it's possible that fewer uh, credit checks are done on these tenants as well. Or <laughs> hopefully. Um, everyone had a bit of um, a rethink about their finances. So it could also be that, that tenants are actually looking at their, at their finances in a different way, um, spending more responsibly, servicing the debt. Lower interest rates, as I mentioned, um, had an effect on the debt to income ratio. You can see that there's um, a smaller percentage of income being spent on debt. Um, and like I also mentioned, we were expecting credit metrics to worsen. Um, and we were also expecting good tenants to leave the rental market because they might be purchasing their own properties, but it doesn't look like that's the case. So that is at least some good news. Then for the last section, a um, uh, sneak peek of the survey results. So every year, well, this was the second year, but we look at who took part, and then we have a few categories. So I'll touch on the most interesting results from these. So 95% of the participants, they work in the property industry. 69% were either a business owner or a rental agent. And then 64% of uh, respondents had rental books of 150 properties or fewer. Looking at technology, this one should come as no surprise. 55% of respondents said that the use of technology increased um, during COVID in their business. Obviously, people were forced to work from home and just make a, a new plan. So that is not surprising at all. Looking at virtual viewings and 3D tours, I was quite surprised by this one, I must say. 70% of respondents said they are here to stay. And 69% of respondents said it's more productive to increase automation than to increase the workforce. This is a great example of working smarter and not harder. Looking at a few uh, portfolio stats, and these will highlight the effect of COVID on the rental market. 70% of respondents said that their rental increases they put through during 2020 were lower than usual. 93% of people said that they made some or other payment arrangement with a tenant. That should show you just how many tenants actually lost a part of their income. 55% said that they have more vacant properties now than the year before. And 64% said that they have lowered their commission in order to keep a landlord on their books. Now, this is a bit of a problematic number because commission is your main income driver when you have a rental business. And once you've lowered that commission percentage, it is quite difficult to push that back up. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Looking at challenges for the year 2020, 51% of, of uh, survey participants said that their biggest challenge is finding good tenants and that the biggest stressor for the year that we are currently in, 68% um, said that they are worried about the ongoing effect of COVID for
for 2020. And I'll end on a bit of good news. How optimistic were our participants about the future of the rental market? Only 5% said negative, 17% said neutral, and a whopping 78% said that they were actually optimistic about the future of the rental market. I had a look at the previous year's results, and then only 62% um, of respondents said that they are optimistic about the rental market. So perhaps we're all thinking about life a bit differently, uh, after COVID, and we are perhaps all a bit more optimistic about the future. That's it from me. If you want more information on rent arrears and credit metrics, you can download the latest annual rental index. I'll drop that uh, link for you in the chat as well. I will now hand over to Jan, who will tell you a bit about what you can expect um, in the near future. Thank you, Yuhit. Um, can I open the camera off, please, for echo purposes? There we go. Thank you very much. Well, good, good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. I'm always delighted to chat to Central South Africa. Being a, a lighted, born and bred in the Northern Cape, uh, more specifically, Katu, I always love uh, chatting to you guys, and I probably should have done it in Afrikaans, but at least you will pick up on my accent that I am from your area. Well, from a Piprop side, from Piprop side, uh, it's our privilege and our pleasure to participate in this awesome event. And I want to thank Amasi, Tracy Lee, Carl, Ben, and the rest of the awesome team at Private Property for affording us this opportunity. Now, Today, I'm not going to share a PowerPoint presentation and beautiful pictures because I think I would have had to title that Death by PowerPoint, as I am going to talk to you about the future, looking into the future, and more specifically, looking at legislation and regulation that has an impact. I'm going to place an emphasis on the rental industry, property rental industry, and I'm going to just remind you of where we are at present. Now, as you all know, the Property Practitioners Act was promulgated or published on 3 October 2019 already. And that being the case, you may be wondering why we as estate agents are still working in accordance with the Estate Agency Affairs Act of 1976. And I think we we'll all agree that this 45-year-old piece of legislation is overdue for replacement. The Estate Agency Affairs Act dates back to an era before the internet, before digital marketing, before social media, and very importantly, also before automated and integrated payment platforms such as Payprop. So the old act simply does not cater for today's realities, and the question is, what does the future hold? So considering the Property Practitioners Act, it's important that we remember that any new act in itself only sets out broad principles of new law. It doesn't deal with the implementation thereof. And that is where the regulations to an act come in, setting out the implementation and the application of the act. Now, although the Property Practitioners Act was published in October 2019, its regulations have not yet been finalized or published, and we're still awaiting that. And only once these regulations are published in the Government Gazette will the act actually be implemented and then we will all have to work in accordance with this new act. And when is that likely to be? Well, we don't know, but what we do know is that the draft regulations to the Property Practitioners Act were public, published for public comment already in March last year. And due to the COVID-19 and lockdown regulations, the opportunity for us as, as real estate professionals to submit comments was extended to 20 November last year, and since then, there hasn't been much. So what can we expect from these regulations? Now, it is important that you must understand I'm not trying to give you legal advice. I simply want to uh, point you in the right direction. I'm going to show you two, two different sections of the Act, and then I'm going to deal with one of the regulations. And I'm not going to read it verbatim. It's going to take me forever. We can all read. All this is public information. It is published on, on the web, uh, the Act as such, and the regulations. And I'm just going to refer you to the relevant aspects. And I think that 
there is some good news for you in, in, this, uh, in the Act and the regulations, especially for the smaller operators. We all know we work in a highly fragmented um, seg uh, segment. People choose to do their own thing quite often. And I think it's important that everybody takes cognizance of the new legislation that will be uh, uh, in act, uh, operative in the near future. I'm going to share my screen. If you will indulge me for one second. And I'm going to start with the trust account stipulations. Now, everybody, most of you are probably well familiar with Section 32 of the Estate Agency Affairs Act that deals with trust money. The, the equivalent of those stipulations is to be found in Section 54 of the Property Practitioners Act, the Act as such, and it is materially the same as Section 32. Um, maybe a little more detail, but it starts off saying that every property practitioner must open and keep one or more separate trust accounts, it must immediately, after opening the trust account, uh, appoint an auditor, and then you must let the authority know, and the authority is the new name for the Estate Agency Affairs Board, will be, and it carries on, and then it, in, in subsection 2, it says also there that you can uh, invest in separate savings or other interest-bearing accounts, the money that is not needed immediately, but typically the section 32.2, of the old act, and then it goes on and tell you what you must do and must do and must do. And as you probably know, the, um, the act is published in multiple languages. So we scroll down and you will see that there are many subsections that deal with what you must and what the court's rights are and what the authority or the EIB can do, etc. So I'm not gonna dwell on the details of that. I think it's important to remember that section 54 deals with trust monies quite comprehensively. If we then jump to something new, something that you should be on the lookout for and potentially want to discuss with your legal advisor and or your auditor, that is section 23 of the new act. And this is where I said the, 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 the act just sets a framework. It doesn't deal with the details. But when we read section 23, only the heading, it talks of exemptions in respect of accounting records and trust accounts. Now, really, really that tells us that there's an intention by the legislature to exempt certain property practitioners from um, keeping accounting records and trust accounts, which is very new and very important for us to understand. Now, reading section 23.1, it says, a property practitioner whose turnover is below 2.5 million rand must cause his, her, or its accounting records to be subjected to an independent review by a registered accountant subject to the provisions of Section 54 that deals with trust monies. Now, this is new in that we're not talking of an audit by an auditor, but we're talking of an independent review by a registered accountant. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is a significant difference to our current situation, and it could lead to uh, loss of cost savings in that you don't have to pay for an audit. But let's read further and look at section 23, subsection 2. The minister may, by notice in the Gazette, determine the circumstances under which certain property practitioners may be exempted from keeping trust accounts. So you may be exempted from keeping trust accounts under certain circumstances if the minister has published such a notice. And then subparagraph B, so the minister may, by notice in the Gazette, also determine a different dispensation for the review of accounting records for those property practitioners. Now, this such shows the intention of the legislator but as I said, it doesn't deal with the implementation or the application. Now, one has to have a look at the draft regulations, and it's not final regulations yet, but it has been um, open for public comment, the periods have closed, and we're pretty comfortable that the draft regulations will pretty much be the final regulations. Now, let's have a look at what that says. And the relevant regulations is regulation four. 
which is on page nine of the uh, property practitioners regulations that was published early 2020 and it says the the heading says it all exemption from trust accounts and then it refers you back to section 23 of the act that i've just uh, um, pointed you to and it says that a property practitioner is exempted from keeping a trust account if that property practitioner has never received any trust monies other than as permitted in regulation 4.4 which we will get to and no longer receives any trust monies other than as permitted in regulation 4.4 and that property practitioner submits and then do certain other things. I'm not going to dwell into the fine print, but these are all very reasonable and achievable things that you must do. If you want to apply for exemption, it makes common sense. Should you read it? So let's move on to regulation 4.2 that states as follows. Where a property practitioner, and you know that's the new name for estate agents, is exempted in terms of these regulations, subject to certain provisions, such property practitioner will not be required to again have such account reviewed or audited. In other words, it's closed. Your historical trust account is history. Subject uh, section 4.3 states where a property practitioner is exempted in terms of regulation 4.1 and has complied with other regulations, such property practitioner will be exempted from having to have its business and other account accounts audited and will only be required to have such accounts independently reviewed by a registered accountant. It's a much simpler, much cheaper process and I think that's good news to many of our property practitioners in the country. Now 4.4 is the very important one. If you are a, a rental agent, if you handle a lot of trust accounts, trust funds on behalf of consumers, we must take cognizance of this, and like I've said, I strongly advise that you take legal advice and also have a conversation with your auditor. We expect this to come into play in the near future. Now, it says that a property practitioner will further be exempted, so subject to all of the above, and subject to being otherwise compliant in terms of all these regulations. Such property practitioner um, will be exempted if he has mandated one or more other property practitioners that specialize in collecting and distributing trust payments. And such property practitioners will be referred to as the payment processing agents, that's typically a pay prop, to process such trust payments on your behalf in respect of all trust funds received by that property practitioner. What is important here is that your payment processing agent must also be a property practitioner by definition with a valid FFC, etc., that specialize in the collecting, in collecting and distributing trust payments. Looking at the next subsection, so you can be exempted if each payment processing agent, like PayProp, mandated by you, operates a trust environment that complies with the Act and associated regulations. Now, that trust environment refers to an entire environment of different agencies' trust account that is auditable as a collective, and that must be reconciled, balanced to the cent, and audited with a report going to the EIAB. We'll pick up on that again further down below. So, you can be exempted in the third place. If each payment processing agent mandated by you within its trust environment as separately auditable client accounts, both in respect of each property practitioner to whom it provides such services and in respect of each client of each such property practitioner. Now that simply refers to the segregation of funds. So your payment processor, like PayProp, has to have a separately auditable account for each estate agency that uses the platform and then it goes further. Within your account that sits in our environment, there also has to be separately auditable accounts for each landlord and each tenant. Looking at um, sub-regulation 4.4.4, three fours on a row, the trust environment, our trust environment, 
and each of your client accounts operated by us are audited annually in compliance with the Act and all regulations and audit reports in respect thereof must be submitted to the authority or the EIAB that assists you with your audit. And then further, you as the property practitioner concerned should not then hold any trust monies whatsoever outside of the manner provided for in these acts. So considering all this, I'm delighted to say that even in the absence of these regulations, before it was drafted, before it was on the cards, PayProp has already complied with all these provisions and we have been providing all our clients, clients with assistance in terms of the audits. We refer to it as an agreed upon procedure between our auditors and yours. So looking into the future, once these regulations are in play, we think it's important that you, your auditor, eventually your attorney, take cognizance of these regulations. You may want to apply. It is very reasonable. And then going forward, it could lead to massive cost saving opportunities lots of avoiding many time delays and inquiries as uh, PayProp as a, an authorized or an accredited payment process provider can uh, assist you through, through, through all these uh, procedures. And it's maybe just for the sake of completeness, I'll scroll down a little more. This, there is an annexure in the regulations that you can, uh, it's an affidavit that you need to complete. And once you are compliant, you can be hopefully soon be exempted from those onerous and expensive audit reports. And on that note, um, I thank you for your time. I thank Tracy Lee and I hand back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jan, and your head for a very insightful um, presentation. Jan, you did quite a bit of work answering questions while your head was talking, so thank you for that. Um, I am going to, I see there's a couple of really interesting conversations that happened in the chat and I'd love to be able to go through them, but I am a little bit pressed for time, Jan, so I'm going to say thank you to you and uh, have a wonderful day. We'll see each other this afternoon at the Afternoon Nexus. Thank you, awesome. Pastor. Studio, thank let's get my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, your head. Can you tell me in the chat if you, uh, if you found that information useful? I know a lot of uh, a lot of us yesterday really really appreciated Jan sharing that nun presentation presentation with us. Okay, so right now I'm going to take you on to the final person, the final uh, person that's joining you on the stage today. His name is Carl Vandenberg, and he is our, as in private properties business development executive. Carl, you're joining us today to give us a glimpse into what the future holds for private property and what partnership really could look like in terms of industry in the future. Over to you, Carl. Thank you so much, Tracy. And uh, to our extended private property family for joining us today. It's an absolute privilege for us to be able to do something like this. Um, you know, we would prefer to be in a, in a physical world and having a coffee with you and just really bonding and connecting and sharing our experiences. But uh, the digital world will have to do for some time still to come. So uh, we're really proud to be able to bring Nexus to, to throughout the country. As Tracy said, I think we're doing eight this week and we've tried to regionalize it as much as possible. So thank you again for joining us. And I hope you're getting information. I, I surely am. So also a big thank you to ABSA as well as to PayProp for, for sharing their knowledge and information. Let's get straight into it. So, uh, you know, a little bit about private property and more case of where are we going? We, you know, we know the backstory of private property. We're 22 years old, but really it's a case of, you know, what is the new private property and, and where are we going as, as a business with our partners? So, we are choosing to become a trusted partner in the, in the property industry. And, you know, it's really about being in the center of the ecosystem. And an example is exactly what we're doing today. Where we're bringing in our partners as well as our clients to come in and share information and share knowledge for the greater good of everybody in industry. So very much this is our role in the ecosystem. 
Um, a little bit that I want to talk around is there's really two sort of areas of our main of our main focus, and the one is the consumer. So what we would classify as a consumer is a buyer, somebody that's looking to rent a property. You know, it's the 57 million people that we have in our country that are either in property, wanting to know about property, or will at some other stage be entering into property. And on the other side, we have uh, our, our clients, our property practitioners, the banks, attorneys, and everybody else. And it really is a bit of a juggling act that we've got to play a lot of the time to make sure that we are listening to both sides of things and getting that balance right. And it's, it sounds a little bit easier than it really is. As an example, if we listen a little bit too strongly to what, let's say, real estate is wanting out of a property portal, we run the risk of absolutely alienating the 57 million people. And what do people do is they vote with their feet and then we all lose. And it's the same. If we listen far too much to what a consumer wants, we then alienate our, our client base. So it really is a, an absolute balancing act and one that we, we've been doing very, very well. Uh, the next thing is really, you know, it's, it's how do we become that trusted partner? And that, that's really the essence of it is the, the real three steps that we do around everything is one is to be completely customer obsessed understanding exactly what your pain points are and looking for solutions around that. And it's both yourselves and again, as the consumers, what we know this, right? So let's say I talk about consumers as, for a little bit. We know that consumers have an absolute thirst for knowledge, which is why we have almost 550,000 people on our Facebook page watching our daily podcasts because they're wanting information. So we understand that that's a, a, a sort of a, a pain point that they have and we need to come up with a solution, which we have. We also need to understand uh, exactly what it is that, that your concerns are, what your pain points are so we can. So once you complete your customer obsession, you've got all of your internal processes geared for that. We then have the ability to solve real, real problems for everybody. And we're wanting to solve these real problems through using digital technology and really just speeding up the, the pace in which we use technology and organization as well as in the, in the greater business of real estate. And then only once you've got those two things there, can you start creating real value propositions. We start looking at real value propositions as an example, something that came out of yesterday morning's meeting, uh, Nexus was somebody was wanting a solution around, you know, before a buyer can put an offer into a property, there, there should be a pre-approval. You know, that's exactly our vision is, we wanted to be able to give that power to yourselves, that when a somebody sends you a lead to go, listen, I wanted to have a look at that property, you know that they've been pre-approved by APSA. You know that they're looking for a three bedroom place in Bloemfontein. They have 2.5 children and a dog and a cat. And that's real, real power. And that's what we wanted to be able to start doing for yourselves. Um, and just a little bit around where private property is. We've got ambitions to, to get to the 5 million unique viewers, uh, use, unique users per month uh, within our five-year strategy. We're way ahead of that number at the moment. Right now, we're averaging 3.2 million unique people that come onto our portal and look at your properties every single month. Just a bit of context, that's more than a million people more than what we were averaging the same time in 2020. And it's more than 2 million people more than what we were doing in 2019 in this time. So there has been rapid growth around what it is that we, uh, we are providing in terms of value to, to real estate. Um, and a lot of that has been driven around some of our doing things quite differently. So let's just unpack where we are in, the, in our five-year strategy. 2019 was really around preparation. So we had a new CEO came in. He brought in a brand new executive team. I think I'm the oldest Exco member. I've been around for about 18 months. So 2019 was really the, the, creating this, this view around where do we want to be. 2020 was our foundation year. That's where we did exciting things like our rebrand. We started engaging with our consumers quite differently. And 2021 is really our watershed um, year, and it's our year of innovation and technology. And I'll, I'll unpack a little bit of what we're going to be doing in the upcoming slides. 2022 is about repositioning ourselves, 23 is around optimization, and then it's all about scale. Because with the right scale, it's, we can give so many more products, so much more value to everybody in the ecosystem. I don't know if anybody noticed, but a year ago, we were quite different. We were red, blue, and, and uh, white. Now we look really, really different with our, our new green. And it's a lot more than just a brand refresh. It's a lot more than just changing colors. To us, it's hard as that we operate, hard as that we engage with our consumers, hard as that we give services and products to yourselves as, as real estate. So it's a fundamental shift 
from what we were to what we are now and where it is that we're going. A little bit around technology. So we talk around, you know, what are the digital trends in fintech? What are the digital trends in prop tech? First, you got to understand that there's, there's sort of two schools of thought. One is sort of evolution of technology and the other one is around revolution of technology. So an evolution would be something like uh, Moore's law, which speaks around how quickly computers can process information is really essentially what it is. So if you have a look at your old Nokia 2110 and you look at your iPhone 12 that you have now, that is a massive shift in terms of technology and ability. But then you consider that that was 25 years ago that we had those Nokia 2110s. So if you look at just in the short area, it looks like a complete revolution and things have just gotten out of hand. But in reality, it's actually quite slow progress. Over I mean, Moore's Law was done in the 1970s. So that's really evolution. What we wanted to focus on is the revolution of technology. By way of an example, what's the revolution of technology? Well, 12 months ago, I was sitting in our private property offices in Oxlunga Rocks KZN with 180 degree sea views. Now I'm talking to you from my home office, waiting for the dogs to bark. I know I've got hardy dogs outside and probably one of my kids are gonna come in and join the meeting at any time. That's an absolute revolution. A year ago, we didn't know what Remo was. We had no idea what Zoom and Teams was. That's an absolute revolution. And it's fundamentally not only changed our lives, but it's changed how consumers shop for property. We know this, consumers are wanting to get a lot more understanding around the property. They're wanting to see virtual reality. They're wanting to see all about the property first before they make the call. Another example is Facebook. We occasionally put um, some of your properties onto our Facebook page. On average, we get 15,000 hits every time we just put a simple advert on our Facebook page. We did a virtual show day the other day on our Facebook page. We had 500,000 people view that property. That is a revolution of how consumers engage with property. And private property, as well as yourselves, need to make sure that we're geared up for that. Just in terms of some of the upcoming stuff that you'll be seeing in private property is we've spent the last 12 months looking at how it is that consumers engage with us as well as yourselves as our clients engage. In the next couple of months, you'll start seeing a very, very different private property. We'll be launching a brand new consumer portal and app. So a consumer, again, is the buyers and renters out there. That will give them a lot better way to navigate and find your properties, understand the area around that property, and for us to get a lot more information about that person so that we can pass it on to yourselves when the lead comes through. We'll also be going live with a new client portal. So it's a new app and a new website. There you'll be able to get area statistics, you'll be able to get information on your leads, you'll be able to get a whole range of information, much of like what we're sharing now, but in time at a click of a button, which will be incredibly powerful for yourselves. So what essentially will happen is we'll go live with the basic of things, it'll look like just a bit of a change, and then every two to four weeks we'll bring on new products, new services, and a fun end, end up with a very, very different way of engaging between ourselves. Uh, so we're incredibly excited about that. Uh, if we just look at um, the human side of things, you know, I, I worry that we talk around digital disruption. So a lot around digital disruption, I suppose, has gotten a bit of a negative connotation. So people think disruption means that it's a, a complete, you know, cutting out the middleman, making, you know, doing things like linking buyers and sellers and cutting out the real estate agent. That's absolutely not what, uh, what we see as, as disruption. What we see as disruption is a different way of doing things. What are your, your, your problems that you have in your, in your world and your way of work? And how can we give you digital solutions? So that makes your life way more efficient. That is what we wanted to do around digital disruption. There is a human being at the end of all of this, a human buyer, a human seller, and a human agent, a human attorney. And we need to digitize this with always keeping the human being behind it in the center of everything that we do. So again, we'll be sharing a lot more information as we get closer to the rollout of our new technology. There's a fair amount of change management that wants to happen. But I suppose I just want to thank everybody for their continued support. We've seen rapid growth. I think Celeste is going to come on now and share some regional specific stuff around how it is that we're fearing um, and some of the insights in your in your area. So again. Thanks a lot for, for uh, joining us today and your continued support. We really do look forward to going on this journey around revolutionizing our industry together.
Thank you so much. The famous uh, quote for 2020. Can you all hear me? Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Nexus uh, for the Northern Cape Northwest and the Free State. Thank you, Carl, uh, for that perfect segue for me to share the exciting um, performance review for, for the regions um, over the, the past year. I'm going to, um, Carl did mention that w what we've tried to do with Nexus is, is take a, a regional approach as far as possible. Um, what I'm going to just uh, as a as a disclaimer is when when we look at the the review or we look at the results, this is for the entire region. If you are wanting a closer look to your specific area of spe specialization, so where you are operating or your area of uh, specialized area of operation, please reach out to us. I will put my email address in the, um, the chat box a bit later, and we would be happy to connect with you um, and unpack your specific area. So when I just bear that in mind when I'm going through through the, the data as we go along. What I'd like to do is I'd like to start off with the Northern Cape. Um, what we've seen in the Northern Cape is some really good results, uh, pos really positive results year on year. Uh, the results have were a bit iffy during uh, 2020, during the lockdown period, um, but that's understandable. But when we have a look at um, the results for quarter one, uh, quarter four, sorry, uh, for 2020 against the results for quarter one of 2021, we are seeing some really encouraging results uh, from a sales listing perspective. So yes, there has been a decline in the number of listings that are being um, loaded onto the portal. That is um, across the board, we're seeing that nationally. So they, there was a drop there of, of 3%. However, we have seen an increase of 22% in terms of views and 13% um, in terms of leads for, for sales in the Northern Cape, which um, I do have to say is, is encouraging. Um, we, we would obviously... Um, yeah, so that's for, for quarter one, quarter two. When we take a look at rentals, uh, for the rental listing performance for uh, the Northern Cape, we are seeing a different picture. Um, so yes, there has been growth uh, year on year um, in terms of leads and views. However, we have seen a decline in terms of leads and views in the first quarter 2021 against the, the fourth quarter of 2020. I think um, UHET has highlighted this um, in her presentation. We all know what has happened um, over the COVID period um, and with um, various um, uh, factors that have influenced this. In saying that, when I look at the national perspective from a listing perspective, uh, point of view for rentals, it is it is not as high as I would have expected. We've we've seen yes, we've seen a decline in the number of listings, a decline of 24%. However, um, views have dropped by 3% and listings by 7%. I mean, and leads by by 7%. So we all know what those factors are that could have influenced that. If we can move on to the next slide, please, Hesti. What we've, we've also done is we have included for you today a top 50 searched properties from a sales perspective in the Northern Cape. If we have a look, a look at the top four or five um, areas, I think those uh, speak for themselves. And again, as I mentioned earlier on um, in, in, in my um, 
my presentation. We would love to to reach out um, and connect with you so that we can unpack a bit further um, those specific areas and how they are performing. Um, and what we can do to, to uh, potentially improve imp uh, performance in those areas. Moving on to um, the median prices, the median listing prices. Now remember, this is your listing price. It is not the price that you fetch or the price that you achieve in terms of your sales or rentals. It is what you have listed the property at, okay? So for um, we can see for sales that uh, the in the Northern Cape the listing the median listing price for sales is tracking above the national average. Um, what we have noted that for the period January February 2021 against January February 2020 there has in fact been an increase in um, the median listing price. The opposite is true for rentals, even though the rental median price is still tracking above the national average, we have noted an 11% decline in the median um, rental listing price, bringing it, um, even though it is still higher, it is bringing it closer to the national average. So that is the, the Northern Cape and how the Northern Cape has been tracking. Let's take a look at the free state, okay? So, for, next slide, please. Here's the, okay. So, for the free state, also some positive results um, in that region, uh, year on year, with regards to views and leads. We are continuing. Yes, our footprint is not as great as we would like in the in the region, but we are working to close that gap. Um, again, really good results year on year. For when we compare the quarter one of 2021 against quarter four of 2020. Uh, we have again seen a decline in the listing count for um, the sales listings at mi uh, uh, minus 1%. So it's, it's a nominal f uh, figure when compared to the national results. Um, views have increased by 22% for the period and leads by 20% which is, is, a, is a really encouraging sign. Uh, when looking at rentals, um, yes, so we know, again, the rental space has seen a decline. Um, however, when we take a look at quarter one against quarter two, um, I mean, quarter one of 2021 against quarter four of 2020, we are seeing some positive results early on. Uh, there has been an increase, which is um, interesting when compared to the national uh, 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 national data. Um, we see an increase in listing counts by 1% and a further increase of 19% in terms of leads and 28% um, the 19% in views and 28% in leads uh, for the period, which is is some really encouraging results. Uh, considering if we take period the period January February 2021 and compare that to January February 2020, not so great, but um, we certainly are tracking a lot better when looking at quarter four 2020 and quarter one for 2021. Taking a look at the top suburbs that are searched for the free state, some interesting results there, or perhaps not so interesting for the professionals in the room. Um, we are taking a look at the sales results. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning, please reach out to us. We would love to get in touch with you so that we can un unpack your uh, area of operation um, and look a little bit deeper um, and drill down a little bit deeper to those areas and how they are tracking. Okay, so when we take a look at the median price, uh, listing price uh, for the region, a below average, uh, below not below average, sorry, below the national median um, on both rentals and sales. However, what we have noted uh, when taking 
January, February 2021 against January, February 2020, there has been an increase in 6%. Uh, similar to, or in fact, exactly the same as the Northern Cape, an increase of 6% in terms of the median listing price for sales um, and an increase of 2% for rentals, which is interesting when compared to the Northern Cape, um, which has had a decline of 11% in uh, rental uh, listing prices. So some interesting results for the free state. Um, moving on to the Northwest, also some really positive results. We are really making gains. All of those things that we are implementing, the innovation, um, the marketing, all of those things that we are putting to, in place um, and our teams that are working feverishly um, in the background are definitely um, starting to pay uh, dividends um, when it when we look at our results. So positive results year on year for sales performance. Um, when we take a look again, just one thing to compare quarter one uh, for 2021 against quarter four. Um, We've seen, yes, we've seen a, a decline, which is in, in keeping with the national um, sort of st stats. Uh, we've seen a decline in listings from a sales performance perspective. Um, <clears throat> however, again, in keeping with national um, stats, we've seen an increase of 22% in terms of views and 23% um, in terms of list uh, in terms of leads for sales listing performance. Very encouraging for the Northwest. Going now on to rentals. Rentals, uh, steadily, uh, we've seen some positive results year on year. A slight um, closing of the gap um, between 2019 and 2020 um, in terms of views and leads. Again, if we have a look at our results for quarter one of 2021 against quarter two of, uh, quarter four of 2020, sorry, um, some positive results. In keeping with national, um, the national performance, we have seen a decline in um, rental listings. Actually, it's not in keeping with national average, I beg your pardon, uh, national stats. We've seen a decline in rental listings um, for the Northwest. However, we have seen an increase in views of 19% and an increase in leads of 11%. Um, some um, uh, encouraging results there. When taking a look at the top 50 searched suburbs, again, Harties right at the top. Um, some interesting results there. Um, again, if you are wanting us to, to get in touch with you, please reach out. We would love to, to meet with you and go through your um, area of operation and unpack the, that data a little bit more um, readily. Um, something interesting for, across all three regions is um, the, the move for semigration. So people looking to... Um, to li looking in areas where they they get to choose where to do life and business. Um, so in the new way of work, we all know how that is. Many of us, I mean, um, um, as Carl mentioned earlier, I'm actually just holding on. I just I'm hoping my doggies don't uh, start uh, chatting to the wildlife. Um, but yeah, people looking um, in terms uh, of comforts or because they are choosing where to do their their um, their business and and lifestyle. Moving on then to the median uh, listing price for the northwest. Similar to the free states, the uh, sales and rental median listing prices are operating below the national uh, median prices, and quite steady uh, for both. I have to say. Just hold on a second. Interesting, though, for uh, January uh, 2021 against January, 20, January, February 2020, we've noticed a slight increase of 4% um, in the median listing price for the Northwest Province. Um, and for the rentals, we've noted a, um, 
a, a, a negative or a, a drop of 20% um, in the median listing price for the same period. Um, some some interesting and not but not so surprising results there. Um, yeah, so that's that's our synopsis or in terms of the performance for the three regions. Um, I'd love to take the opportunity to thank each and every one of you uh, for your continued support on behalf of myself and my team, um, as well as the Greater Private Property team. Again, I am going to plug in my email address uh, in the chat box. Please feel free to reach out to uh, either myself or your specific relationship manager if you are wanting any um, deep dives into your specific area of operation. Thank you and stay safe. Thanks. Thank you so much, Celeste. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Celeste? We've got about 14 or so minutes left. There was a question or a request rather from Lizette so Simon. Um, she's asking if we'll be able to get the stats emailed to uh, them and she's dropped her email address down there for us to be able to do so. Celeste, we'll definitely be able to share some stats with you. Uh, Chantal Erasmus has had to leave, unfortunately. Um, and then thank you, Carl from Tando, uh, Johan Janse van Rensburg, thanking Carl and also welcoming Celeste onto the stage. Babawa Wolf saying, I love real estate. We love it with you, honey. We're with you in that quest. All right. I think this brings us to the end of a really productive uh, session. Although we've run a little bit over, I still feel like there was a lot of value. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, you're welcome to leave the stage now. I don't see any major questions that we're not going to be able to handle in the chat box itself. But before I go, I just wanted to say that concludes the end of our, our, our formal lineup. A huge thank you to our partners, APSA, and also to Payprop, uh, Yohet and Jan for sharing their knowledge with us. Thank you, Tando. Private Property appreciates every single one of you in attendance today, the property professionals that are here. And we trust that you've gained valuable insights that will help you tackle this market um, and achieve the success that you want to achieve for your business and your own brand um, in spectacular fashion. And don't forget to get your one and a half uh, non-verifiable CPD points from AISA. The link will post, let's put it in the chat again. Um, thank you. Let's put that link in the chat so you can click on it and get your points, one and a half points. While the session is over, we've got about 12 minutes or so um, where we'll leave the platform open and um, grab, grab a cup of coffee and maybe go and say hi to your fellow colleagues. Um, thank you. Thank you to, to the many of you. Many of you have actually dropped us hearts and dropped us uh, um, comments and kept the energy going. Really, really appreciate it. And with that in mind, I'd like to um, afford to or give two prizes away today. One for the person who's been super, super engaging. That's Johan Janse van Rensburg. And then one of the best questions we heard today came from Mike Spencer. I'm not sure if Mike is still in the room. Let me see. I'm just scrolling down. I think Mike is definitely still in the room. And Johan, you are definitely still in the room. Someone from my team will reach out to you, either Trish or Ben, just to get your details and get that prize out to you. So thank you once again. Um, the last thing I'm going to ask that you do, if you haven't already subscribed to our Private Property Weekly Industry Newsletter, please do. We're also going to put that link in the chat for you. Um, if you're joining us this afternoon for the afternoon nexus, please note that we also have another nexus tomorrow and the day after where we will be tackling the Cape Town area and the Johannesburg areas. You know, even if you're based in the central part of this country and you want to understand what's happening in these regions, you're more than welcome to attend. But thank you so, so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye from me.